All right, so next we have Melissa Oman coming here from uh, URI, and she'll be talking about POC export uh, at mesoscale and sub-mesoscales. All right, thank you uh, so much, Dennis and Andrea, for inviting me here. I've, uh, been, I've attended the OCB meeting every year since I was a first year postdoc at, uh, at HUI here, so I'm really honored to be speaking today. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about POC export, uh, mainly at sub-mesoscale, but also uh, some at the mesoscale, and, um, and its implications for not only uh, non-sinking uh, particulate um, carbon, but also uh, potentially for sinking carbon as well. Um, and I think it's nice to, to keep in mind, you know, this has been pointed out in a variety of other um, settings as well, that any of the physical dynamics that, um, that move uh, water and biogeochemical tracers vertically in the water column, those will, um, these dynamics will have impacts on uh, oxygen fluxes, nutrient fluxes, um, inorganic forms, and dissolved organic carbon as well. So we'll start with talking about uh, some meso and sub -meso scale um, instabilities, and then an approach that um, where I tried to visualize the three-dimensional field of what those um, what those dynamics or processes might look like in terms of the implication for non-sinking particulate organic carbon in the surface. And then I wanted to discuss a little bit about what the um, implications of this process are for long-term sequestration. And uh, Zach, uh, the student from Caltech, um, talked about this a little bit in his presentation as well, and I think it's a very important um, topic to, uh, to think about. Um, so I'll be able to go into a little bit more detail on that. And then finally, uh, how some of these uh, dynamics might affect sinking particles. So mesoscale and submesoscale instabilities generally arise in regions of strong lateral buoyancy gradients, so near fronts. And there's a variety of different flavors of uh, these instabilities that occur on a variety of different scales. Um, there can be baroclinic instabilities uh, through which the energy in the larger scales cascades to the submesoscale and can lead to frontogenesis. There are mixed layer instabilities, uh, which cause eddy slumping and frontal slumping in the mixed layer. There are symmetric instabilities, which can arise through interactions between the relative vorticity and the planetary vorticity. Um, another example of a symmetric instability would be an interaction between the wind and the, um, particularly in a long front wind and a frontal system as shown in the schematic by Eric Desaro. And then finally, there can be gravitational instability. So these are just cases where you have, you end up with uh, heavier water on top of lighter water and that causes mixing. So this can arise through uh, surface heat fluxes, for example. And so the temporal and the spatial scales for all of these different kinds of processes, which um, can occur on the submeso scale have really, really different biogeochemical impacts and different characteristics. There are also, I think it's really important to also think of um, the submeso scale as containing a lot of variability that don't have to do with just these dynamics as well. For example, the internal wave field can be really, really challenging to uh, deconvolve from uh, some of these um, other processes, and again, will have a very different implication for any of the biogeochemical processes. Um, observing and really, like, I think, getting to um, getting observations that are adequately resolving the dynamics on these scales is a really active area of physical oceanography right now. I think it's a really wonderful opportunity when uh, we can partner with physical oceanographers and try to evaluate, look at how uh, some of these processes influence the um, biological and chemical um, uh, processes as well. Um, but it's, it's tremendously uh, challenging, I think, to observe. And a, a great deal has been learned through numerical modeling approaches. 
So I'm going to talk about a couple of examples of numerical modeling um, simulations. So this is from a simulation done by Leif Thomas, published in 2012. Uh, his domain goes spans 200 meters in the vertical and only four kilometers in the horizontal. So there's a very uh, steep, um, strong lateral buoyancy gradient here, um, here given by the temperature field. The isopycnals here tilt upward toward the surface. And the mixed layer depth, if we were, I just drew that mixed layer depth in sort of a guess as to where it might be. But it would, um, it would vary quite a bit across that small scale. And so those tilting isopycnals um, you know, try to come into a geostrophic balance. They set up a vertical shear in the along front direction, um, which is shown by this along front velocity here. And then there's also some ageostrophic motion that drives a cross front circulation. So the warmer water at the surface tends to start to move in the positive x direction flattening out these, um, these isopycnals, and the cold water on the other side of the front tends to move um, downwards and also underneath that warm water. Um, we can also look at now what some of those small scale processes uh, might look like for carbon export. So in this case, this is a, a much larger model domain. This is using the um, Amal and Mahadevan sub-mesoscale um, or process um, study ocean model. So here, the vertical is 600 meters. This is 200 kilometers. And then looking back into the page is about um, six or 800 kilometers. And what we're looking at is the um, non-sinking sort of particulate organic carbon or, or phytoplankton biomass that has been grown in the euphotic zone. Um, the strongest uh, concentrations are shown in purple. And the gray contours reflect basically boluses or contours of higher POC water that have um, been, that appear or push down from the surface and appear below the euphotic zone and below the mixed layer. So we can start to step through this model. I'll also say that the, the time step here is every two and a half days. And this is from the North Atlantic bloom simulation. So this is just after the bloom peak. So after stratification has started to set up and it's now moving from the spring into the early summer. And so we see a lot of... Um, movement in these boluses. They're advected. They transform. Um, they actually start to shrink a little bit over the course of the spring. And they also seem to get deeper as well. Um, they're shrinking because they're sort of less warmed at the surface as you get stronger and stronger stratification. And also, um, and also they're shrinking because of some of the um, diffusivity in the model. The, the contour line that I chose them based on is, is um, the gradient is decreasing. And you'll see over the course of the summer, now we're sort of in midsummer, um, they've sort of disappeared. And um, again, Zach discussed, so this is really a, uh, an along, a largely along isopycnal process. So none of these boluses, even though they reached well below the mixed layer, they did not ever reach below the depth of the deep winter mixed layer. So the depth of the initial, um, the initial uh, sort of winter mixed layer front. And you know this is consistent with what you would expect for a largely a long isopycnal process. And I think it's, it's relevant when we want to think about what the long-term implications are for carbon sequestration. So I would, I would just argue a little bit um, that it's not that these advective processes 
don't result in carbon export, but they result in carbon export when combined with the onset of stratification, for example, over the course of the spring to summer transition, which effectively traps that carbon at depth. And so if combined with other processes, so over time that carbon will, um, that particulate carbon will become remineralized, turn back into DIC, and if all of it is retained in that same range of depth, then you can imagine the following winter, it all would get mixed back up to the surface. So it wouldn't result in a net, um, a net sequestration of carbon. But if there are processes that transform that carbon over the course of, the, of seasons, such as aggregation, if there's even a slow sinking component, which I think there's been some really nice evidence from some um, bioargo floats to, to indicate this, and also any large-scale circulation where you move that carbon to depth. And now over the course of the, a few months, if it moves to a place where the deep winter mixing isn't as strong, then it will stay sequestered at depth. So there's sort of a, a combination of different factors that could lead to um, a net sequestration that is ultimately sort of derived <coughs> from these physical um, processes. And so I would really say that we, I hope to see more observations for which we can really track and observe particle transformations, ideally in a Lagrangian frame, to, um, on the subducted water over periods of time that last from weeks to months in order to really understand what the long-term implications of um, carbon sequestration are for these um, processes. So now I'll talk a little bit about sinking particles. Um, there's been some nice uh, work. Megastapa demonstrated that there was a lot of variability in, um, in sinking flux uh, seen at submesoscales. And Mike Stuckel recently had a paper um, in KNAS that showed that there was enhanced um, sediment trap flux observed at fronts relative to offshore and coastal systems. And um, there's, a whole, there's a variety of different sort of explanations as to what, uh, why that might be the case. There's also a variety of different reasons why one might observe variability at submesoscales. Um, but I think it's, it's useful to try to sort of frame the, um, frame the, the, the question in terms of what some of the uh, vertical velocities or the subduction rate might be for the physical processes and kind of compare them to some of the characteristic sinking rates or observed sinking rates of different types of particles. And so moving from the largest scales that are associated with the lowest um, vertical velocities to the smallest scales, which often have some of the highest vertical velocities. Um, we can have Ekman pumping, large-scale subduction, mesoscale eddies, and then submesoscale processes can span a large range, and then boundary layer turbulence um, can also sort of drive vertical velocities. And these really overlap at the same order of magnitude with a whole variety of sinking rates of different types of particles. And so the small uh, single cell particles that have very low sinking rates um, are likely to be influenced. Um, their sinking rates or their vertical motion will be influenced by this whole suite of different physical processes, or I guess I could say dominated by that. Um, but even the fast sinking particles like aggregates and fecal pellets uh, can be influenced by, um, they can have their vertical motion influenced by some of these other um, dynamics. And um, finally, I just wanted to um, talk about the sort of how do we, how do we address this issue of, um, of particles that are sinking at a variety of different rates, have a variety of different characteristics, and um, densities and various traits, and 
they're all in a sort of in a dynamic field that has its own variability. Um, and I would I would love to see a way forward where we uh, utilize the you know availability and the low cost of cameras, for example, to uh, take a, to just quantify what the variability is of sinking particles on scales that are shorter than the typical um, sediment trap deployment time, for example. Um, and so this is a, a time-lapse movie that, um, that I did on a, a cruise in February on the RV Falcor. So pretty recently, we're still kind of working through the interpretation and analysis of some of this data. But, um, but I think it added some really valuable new information to our observations. So this was an upward-facing camera that um, was mounted below a custom uh, cylindrical sediment trap. There was a polyacrylamide gel layer in the bottom that trapped and preserved the particles. And then the gel layer, layer was illuminated by LEDs in a ring around the outside. And a photo was taken every 20 minutes for a 60-hour total deployment. So we're looking up through the tube, that's the tube right there. And so you can start to see the arrival of different types of particles. This is what I was really hoping to be able to quantify, even if we don't um, you know, we can see some of the traits of the particles, even if we don't know exactly what their identity is. Um, and we certainly see that. I, another thing that I thought was really interesting is that I um, detected and counted all the particles in this, uh, in this region. And it was relatively linear over the 60 hours. There was a pretty consistent accumulation of the number of particles. Um, I'll play that again. There's a bunch of stuff in there. Um, but then when we looked at a smaller scale, and so I did go through the process of tracking each of these particles so that I could sort of pin them into their arrival place and look at sort of what, how much information do you gain by looking at a bigger and bigger area or field in your, um, in your cup and, uh, you know, how much do you gain from that? Because there's trade-offs. We're sort of trading off between the number of particles that we could see and the level of magnification. Um, and, and so that was, that was a, a useful exercise. I sort of came down to the tentative conclusion at this point that you'd need about um, a two to three or four centimeter sized area um, to really capture most of the, the um, information. Another thing that uh, really was kind of a interesting surprise, I guess, was that there are zooplankton that show up. Uh, <laughs> if you guys could see that, they're like these ghostly sort of figures in the background. Um, and so I counted them in each frame and they're is it's really, really consistent. They just arrive during the day. So this, this trap was deployed at 150 meters, and so this is during their diel migration. And um, there are lots of things, I guess, that we learned just about the sort of challenges of doing sediment trap deployments where, um, you know, in this case, this, this tube wasn't um, baffled or protected in any way from attracting zooplankton down into it. Um, we did make sure that the light only went off uh, when the picture was taken, so it wasn't attracting bugs. The first time we did this deployment, we actually left the light on because we hadn't, the trickiest thing was, it was an iPhone actually, and the trickiest thing was figuring out just how the iPhone would tell the LEDs to turn on. And so we hadn't figured that out, so we just left the light on, and it, it's like a horror movie. I wish that I'd included it. It, it just fills up with, um, with the kind of amphipods, it's just like, you know, just nighttime comes and all of a sudden one, two, three, four, five, and then the whole entire field is just there <laughs> writhing around. <laughs> anyway, um, but I was happy for the second deployment of this. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, this is, um, so this trap is, it's uh, about seven centimeters wide, so about 30 centimeter uh, area, centimeters squared. Um, the gel layer is about 
half a centimeter. The length is 80 millimeters. And the camera was a, was a fish eye. I just wanted to see the whole thing to start off with. I may not do that again because I don't think we actually needed to see the whole thing necessarily. So um, there's a little bit of distortion, but we can, we can correct for that. Um, and so, but I wanted to leave off with my last slide because these were um, gel traps. We were able to retrieve them and look at them under the microscope on the ship. And so this is a stitched together image of about 30, um, 30 individual photographs taken at seven times magnification of the cup. Um, and so that exact same cup that was from that video. And we can really zoom in and see just the really beautiful diversity of different types of particles, different animals, and uh, various other individual cells and things in there that um, I wish that we could see from the camera. Maybe that's my, my goal for, uh, for, you know, I have sort of a, something to aspire to in terms of future uh, development of this. And um, I just wanted to really thank my, my grad student, Noah, who did a huge amount to make the, um, the time-lapse camera happen. And then um, some really wonderful women and scientists that are my collaborators on this work, Amalim Mahadevan, uh, Colleen Durkin, Meg Estafa, and Ivana Senet. And of course, URI for startup funds and the funding agencies. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Jo Richardson from Texas A&M. I think you misspoke. You said 80 millimeters. I think you meant for the for the height of the trap. Oh, Do you mean shoot. centimeters? I did misspoke. Miss okay, yeah, so it, it's yeah. a it's about a one to ten, I one think to it's eleven. Centimeters. It, it's like a one to ten aspect ratio. Yeah. Okay, and uh, your gel was half a centimeter. Okay. Why am I seeing the particles move? Uh, Migrate outward, yeah. outward in the field. So what what is that? That is a great question. So we worked kind of hard to make sure that the um, that the trap was was gimbaled so that um, it wasn't like doing any major tilting or anything like that. But it's surface tethered. I really think that this kind of observation should be made from a Lagrangian platform that's not um, that's not surface tethered. So it's not. We had a bungee that was trying that uh -huh. was absorbing some of the wave motion, but I still think there was some. And the gel isn't a, like a stiff gel. It's sort of a, you know, it's, it's kind of gooey. There's, it's like, like a little more viscous than honey. I strongly recommend you talk to this gentleman here. He's uh, <laughs> Wilf Gardner. He's a, a sediment trap expert. Yeah, uh, what happened with uh, Alexander Pochdansky, Ultimate University, what happened with the particles that disappeared? Yeah, that's a Did great the question, swimmers get right? Them? So, I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, Colleen, as soon as, we, um, as soon as we pulled this on board, she was really interested in what happened. You know, when the particles, do they transform or change when they're in the gel? The idea is that it's an anoxic environment. Yeah. It's like, you know, it's thick enough that once the particle sinks in, it doesn't change too much. So. I mean, I don't, I don't know what those particles are. We can try to zoom in on them and see what, see what happens. But there are some that disappear. Yeah, they just and disappear. No they don't decay. They just. But yeah. at least we have the observation to see that it's happening. 